Queen Elizabeth II, a monarch who reigned for 70 years over a kingdom that used one and perhaps two too many letters per word far too often. And what better way to honor that monarch than to paint an entire steam engine purple, signifying her 70th jubilee. I'm not sure exactly how many monarchs want a steam engine painted purple for them, but if a Brazilian pop singer can have an entire model of locomotive named after her, I don't see what is wrong with painting one purple after Queen. Now it's important to know that this model railroader finds purple particularly awesome. This model railroader is also an archer, and when his sponsor asked him what color he wanted his shirt, he asked for it to be in pink and purple, and whose primary bow is also purple. The locomotive belongs to the Severn Valley Railway, which is excursion slash historical railway in the United Kingdom. I hope that's not <laughs> any surprise. And uh, this was one they actually run for excursions and repainted occasionally, depending on their needs. And the Platinum Jubilee was certainly a need, but they couldn't leave it at that. They had to team with Hornby to launch this thing in OO scale. And it sold out quick because there were only 2,500 of them in circulation. You had to get your pre-order in early if you wanted to get one of these things. And of course, I got one of these things. So stay tuned and we'll take a look at mine and we will see what's happening with it. All right, everyone. Today's episode is brought to you by Super Smooth Hobby Lubricants. Super Smooth Hobby Lubricants are 100% synthetic, and they come in medium oil versions, light oil, and PTFE or Teflon grease in this handy tube. These are very recent and modern formulations. The company that actually manufactures the oil and grease for Super Smooth is a very, very well-known company, and Super Smooth worked with their chemists to make sure that these would fulfill the needs of modern hobbyists. These formulas are specifically designed not to gum up, and they're designed also not to attract any kind of grease or dirt or dust. So remember Super Smooth. It's slicker than smooth. I mean, we do have to think about this. A purple engine, really? Well, it's actually not just purple. It has an undercoating of maroon, which the paint manufacturer said would help the purple pop. So they actually, this is actually pretty purposeful. They wanted to make sure it's not only purple, but they wanted to make sure the purple pop. So here it is, and here's the guy. It is hand painted on there on top of that. Pretty, pretty impressive. And painted by Ronan, who works quickly to ensure an even finish and has to stop regularly to thin the viscous paint down. So if you happen to visit this place, ask for Ronan and give him a pat on the back for painting this entire steam engine. I doubt I'd do it or I'd find some way to do it with a power painter or explosives or something like that. When asked why this was done, this is what the railway had to say about it. So research shows that if an engine is named or if an engine has a non-standard livery, it draws more crowds, it makes more of an impact. You can't get more of an impact than purple. I suppose I could appreciate the instrumentalist approach. Nothing wrong with that. And when those associated with the railway were asked about this new color, let's just say that their opinion was less than gleeful. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, what do you think of this one in, in purple? I think it's only really different. I absolutely was uncertain when it uh, when it was first announced. I thought it was a potty idea. It was strange at first, but having seen it running, you get used to it. I mean, the railway played an absolute blinder doing a purple engine. I never thought I'd ever see it. Because it was due to repaint anyway. That was a given. But in the end, it sure drew crowds and the corresponding pounds that went along with them. It's really important that we think of novel ideas to attract people who might not be interested in trains, but want a nice day out. We wanted to stand out a bit, and what better way to stand out than paint a locomotive purple? I mean, you really cannot argue with that, can you? You can't miss it either. All right, let's go ahead and break this thing out of here. It came with an outer box. Here it is. It's got a little 
purple label on it, so you know, but not a whole lot else, but here we go. One thing I was really concerned about was when I saw this 21 pin connection, my gosh, people need to get rid of 21 pin connections, but even worse, Hornby doesn't seem to do a good job of implementing it. But let's see how it goes. Let's go ahead and get this open. Let's see, it looks like it got a little bit crushy crushed, but we'll go ahead and pull this out and make sure I think the inner box is okay. There it is in all of its purple glory. Let's pull the wrapper off here. There we go, very, very purpley. All right, there is the thing itself. Looks good. Seriously though, go to a Plux connection. Okay, it's got this nice spiel on the back of it. I like it just in case I wonder why the heck did I buy this thing? I've got this to look at. Very, very cool. So there it is telling you that once again, there are only 2,500 of these in existence, although there are probably a few more in reality. Let's get this fully unsheathed. And there we go. There are directions that you're usually really Spartan with Hornby. You have very Spartan directions. That's good in some ways. I think some, some companies go way too much into everything probably more than they need to. So here's a bunch of extra parts you can put on, lubrication, that kind of thing. But all right, I can see these sound and DCC instructions. We'll see if those work out. Now, of course, everyone wants to get 2022. No, I didn't, I got 1544, fair enough. But there's the very regal looking certificate that comes with these, very nice, I like it. So I'm kind of somewhere in the middle-ish, fair enough. All right, well, that will stay with the box. So I will have that forever and ever. I like it. Let's tear into this a little bit more. All right, put that away and we will pull this out of here. Okay, we've got these parts and pieces that need to go on eventually, but we'll see what's happening with it all first. Let's get the beastie out of here. Wow, look at that. There's <laughs> absolutely no doubt that he is 100% purple. All right, great. And you know, there, there's actually a clip in one of those videos where they go up and they actually check to make sure that the final product matches directly. And it looks like it certainly does. Let's get you walked around the locomotive. Here it is um, just laid out in front of you. Really nice. I like it. I find it to be striking actually. And of course it helps that one of my two favorite colors completely inundates this thing. Um, I don't know if they'll ever have a pink locomotive but you can be assured that if they ever do, I probably will get one. As you can see, it's a Pacific type arrangement. So uh, I really enjoy the Pacific. It looks fairly well balanced to me. Um, and I think that shows here. Um, unfortunately, one of the things I want to point is a bit of a downside. Hornby, as I think I've said before, oh, it does have sprung buffers. So at least that's nice. Hornby seems to be more of a toy company that produces model trains. And I mean, it's 2022, why aren't their headlights just nominally? I don't, let's see, I just don't get it. I just don't get why there aren't headlights. All right, that being griped about, the detailing's pretty nice, right? I mean, these are very nice pinstripes on the sides of the running boards. The wheels look pretty good. Looks like they've, they've matched the prototype pretty well. Nice striping on the cylinder cover. I like that quite a bit. Although I'm gonna to have to go watch the video again because if you notice, they're not quite 90 degrees. Yeah, they're a little bit offset, but it may be that way on the prototype. I'm not entirely sure. Well, the running gear looks pretty well made and yeah, I think this will look really nice running down the track. The rods aren't overly bulky and chunky like I've seen some Hornby models. Looks like they've done a pretty good job here. Pretty decent detailing on the piping, although, you know, just the paint looks a little too chewy, looks a little too glittery, but I think that's okay, especially at past three feet. Let me turn on the light here so you can see the trailing truck, and like usual with Hornby, it's unsprung. I don't know, I don't know why, I guess it's a cost savings measure, but yes, if you have uneven track, it could prop the driving wheels up off of the track, which you could lose quite a bit of traction. I didn't have any problems with mine, at least on my main oval, but it's possible that it'll cause issues on yours. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention it before, but these two ladders up in the front of the tender, yeah, those are coming off. They're, they're held on with just a tiny amount of glue. Ugh. Rear of the tender looks pretty nice, actually. Double ladder system again, although, you know, no lamps, which I think they could have done here, would have made this really nice, and I think the queen would have really been proud. But yeah, it looks pretty good, and the buffers are sprung back here also. 
Top looks pretty nice, no doubt about it. There's nothing really to do up here. The coal load is removable, and I think it looks pretty decent. So uh, I'm at least pleasantly surprised by that. One thing I noticed about the purple here, you can kind of see it in the glint of the light, but I'm wondering if the actual purple on the real steam engine is smoother than this. It has, I think maybe a lot of it though has to do with kind of the slightly grainy plastic that Hornby uses. So, um, but yeah, if you look, it's not bad. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure how accurate. Oh, by the way, this thing, this is gonna break too. And if we look inside, they have really nice painted cab interior details. I like that. Um, it's a little bit hit and miss, as you know, with most steam engines, but they did a nice job here. It's very clear that they cared about this and wanted to do the best job that at least Hornby could do on this. And I think they made good on a lot of that. As per usual, no traction tires, so you have to rely completely on adhesion for this thing to do its work. And the rear trucks are not active. All right, after I put it up on rollers, I decided to go ahead and put it on rollers right away. I had some misgivings really early on, and uh, I was hoping, I, I don't know, I haven't necessarily had any problems with Hornby drives before, but yeah, this one already didn't look good right out of the box. So I'm like, uh, oh, what's causing that? I, I didn't know, you know, maybe something was stuck in the gearing or something like that, but I went ahead and ran it in for an hour, and frankly, things just didn't get better, as you can see here. And I ran it on rollers, but um, I just didn't like that at all. And I started looking for, I figured it would smooth out, but I started looking for problems, and I think I found it. Got the primary driving wheel, the middle driving wheel there. And that always almost indicates bent axle or yeah, or it's, it's got a broken axle or something like that. Or perhaps a wheel that's not properly seated on the axle. So I'm like, okay, well, maybe things maybe things will get better here. Although I'm not entirely sure why I thought that. But they never really did. In fact, I think they got worse. In fact, I know things got worse. So I'm not gonna, I'm not, it's no reason in holding back the surprise. This actually had to go back to go back all the way to England. And the problem is, um, are the center drivers, that's the one that picks up the gear, they were so loose, they're actually coming out of quarter just running. That's why you're seeing kind of the seizing motion. They were completely coming out of quarter. So I'm like, well, that's super. In fact, one time it got so bad and it seized so hard that I actually had to take off um, one of the sets of driving rods just to unstick it because I was afraid it was doing damage. And, yeah, you know, I was kind of hoping I could look through here and see maybe if it was rubbing on something like that. And by the way, if you're having these kinds of problems, using your camera to zoom in with a bunch of light is actually a pretty good way to see if you can see. Sometimes, you know, the drive rods are bent and it'll hang up on the side of the wheel or something like that. I was thinking maybe it was that easy and I could just gently bend a drive rod back but as I was looking around, and this is actually the footage of me looking around, I simply couldn't discover anything wrong with it at all. I just see that jumping, ugh, just, it, just, it just makes me kind of ill. And I thought, well, you know, maybe the wheel is rubbing too hard up against, but it's, it's just not the case. I mean, it was out of quarter, and there's just, like I said, there's so much movement and so much slop in that main driving wheel that it, it just never ended. So that's, that's what I was left with, and that's, where we're at now. But I love all you guys and I wasn't going to just let it ride, so. I decided to go ahead and go through this DCC install anyway and that way, you know, maybe this will help you out. I can at least do that if I'm not gonna be able to keep this thing. Yeah, but I'm, I'm still clenching about this. All right, so anyway, in figure 12 here, you gotta pull these two screws off of the back of the tender and when we get this done, we're gonna install a uh, Economy UK Steam, unfortunately, 21 pin when it should be either an 8, which I'd be happy with, or a 16 or 22 plugs. Gosh, I wish they were using one of those. So let's pick this up really quick and see. Yeah, there's the, you can see them, right? The two screws, they're in the all the way down in there. So that is what we are going to unscrew first. Let's go ahead and get to that. And I noticed it took me a while to find a screwdriver that worked particularly well. 
These are screwed in pretty tight and my tiny ones, I just couldn't get enough torque on them, but the big ones just had too big of a head. So I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a real pain. So it took me a while to, to figure this out. And I realized for my sanity, it would probably be a good idea for me to go ahead and, and at least remove the screw that holds the tender to the draw bar. And that way I'm not having to move both the locomotive and the tender at the same time. All right, next, this little thing kind of towards the, I, I really don't know what that is. It's a handle for something, right? I have, I have no idea. I don't know much about British steam locomotives. Just had to grab a, um, a tweezer that had a relatively fair amount of purchase and there it goes. It comes right out, so no problem there. Now this was the suck. This was terrible. This reminded me of the Tangara. I just, you know, it, it, you're supposed to kind of drop the bottom part out and then sort of pull on it and eventually the two will slide apart. Well, that just, yeah, that just sort of didn't work that way. And I'm, I'm really afraid, right, to put too much pressure on it or to yeah, so I, I just, oh my goodness. So I, I sat there for a while and sort of wiggled it back and forth, listening to make sure I didn't hear any cracking or anything like that. I'm putting a, just not a lot of pressure on it. But finally, this is what we see. And yeah, uh, probably, you know, those little tiny, little tiny hooks are going to get sanded down just a little bit before this goes back on to the locomotive. So yeah, probably a little material is going to be taken away there because it took me a while to kind of coax that out of there and I hated every single second of it. And what I finally did is I, I just pushed a little bit on those tabs that I just showed you. I just kind of worked them until, you know, I could tell they were starting to come. And again, I did this so gingerly because I don't want to break these things. So I was just doing it very, very gingerly and finally they came apart. So yeah, those tabs are just too big. Okay, so when we got inside, here's what we see. So in order to get to the speaker and get that in there, gosh, the design here, somebody really needs to go to prison for this design. And I don't mean like, you know, level one prison where you get to play tennis all day. This one really deserves uh, some really hard prison time. Okay, so if you notice, you have to take the two screws off that you see here. These eventually have to come out, but lo and behold, you can only take one of them out really easily. The one on the left side, you can't do that. So you have to pull the controller board out first and but the problem is you have to do that to get to these two screws you know instead of just making it so that you could pull the screw now you have to take the controller off to get and this is just a dummy controller by the way you have to pull that off so you can get to those two screws so that you can finally get to the screw to the left it's yeah it's just really terrible and I I just don't know what they were thinking here so that's what we're gonna have all right so here we go with that oh my gosh I have to go through this oh my gosh this horrible ridiculous fire drill pull those off pull that out slip that through there okay so now we have this which the in you know part of the issue with 21 pin is the speaker's already supposed to kind of be in there, but note you have to solder it on to these pads here. Through the magic of video editing, we'll just do that right away. So here is the speaker, and I've, I've soldered the wires onto those two pads that I've showed you. Yeehaw. By the way, before you comment this is a dry socket, it's not, I promise. I just didn't close up the wires very well. All right, so theoretically, we can just put this, the controller plug back through there, and then set the speaker down and we should be good to go. So let's put that in there. 
Should be no problem. It just fits in that little hole there. There we go. It just sits in there like that. You can see the sound, the air gasket, sealing the speaker to the bottom of the tender and just put this plate back over the top of it. And we should be able to put these screws in, right? Just plop that down in there and start twisting on it. Twist, twist, twist. There we go, I can fill it, dig in, and we put the other screw down on there. And I'm not feeling it dig. Not really feeling it dig in. I'm not quite sure. Oh. So you know what, they didn't make this very good. They basically, because they didn't plan very well for this, I'm actually going to have to cut a majority of this gasket off so that it'll sit more flush with the bottom of the tender and that'll allow this plate. And of course, it would this all would have been fine if they would have given me longer screws. They gave me like the shortest possible screws that they could. So yeah, I, it's a real pain for them not to take into account some slot between different speaker manufacturers this one just has, happens to have a longer, or excuse me, a, a higher gasket than the rest of them. But no, they couldn't properly pull in for that and give me longer screws. Now, since we're going to be still behind, I'm going to use 21 pin soundtracks. And I've had issues with 21 pin and Hornby before. Let's see how this one goes. Cross our fingers, put it on there, and firstly we see that, nope, the freaking pins are so short, There's it's, it's at an angle. So what I might be able to do is move the wires from the top side of this board to the bottom side of the board. That might give me a little bit more room, but that's only one of the problems. But let's see if we can fix one of the problems first. Yeah, yeah, let's see if we can do that. Okay, so I moved all the wires, except for the speaker wires, to the bottom, and it doesn't help a ton, but it does help a little bit. Yeah, so it helps a little bit, but that's not the only issue here. The other issue is that this is fitting so loosely, it takes no real pressure to pull it off. It, it, it basically gravity can almost slide it down onto the pins all by itself. And this is a problem with the 21 pin specification because it doesn't do a very good job of specifying how long these pins should be. This is why the pluck system is so much better because the manufacturer just puts the pins on their chip and that way they know they're long enough. But see, yeah, this just, it, yeah, it's amazing. It's like there's lubricant or something. It just fits, yeah, it just slides over and there's absolutely no tension whatsoever on the controller. So what I've done, and by the way, I tried this with a lock sound and it's the same problem. What I've done is taken something really flat and gently, and I mean gently, see if you can just push the pins apart a little bit to get it a little bit of friction going in. I hate having to do this. I've only had to do this on one other model and I, I didn't like it then either. So it's still fitting on there pretty loose. Yeah, but let's see if that'll help. So it does for the most part, but I can still rock this around and see how easy that comes off of there. What I'm going to do when I get this thing back is I'm actually going to solder directly onto the board. Like usual, I had a Consus sitting around. I picked them up when I could find them cheaply, but I can't remember where I found this. And this is a set of Bachman Great Westerns. I have no idea if they're supposed to go on there I don't know where they went originally. I'm just not any kind of an expert on British Rail as much as I would like to be. And I actually can't remember where I picked these up, but they were pretty cheap and I'm like, those look great. And actually when I got them, I was surprised. They're very nice looking cars. I think they're arguably the best looking British cars that I own. 
and I think they'll be a fine addition to this as soon as I get it back from Hornby, which will be who knows when. But since this is an excursion train, I can run whatever I want behind it. I can run whatever I want behind it anyway, but I think it'll look really, these will look really nice contrasted with the purple. So I have a bunch of them. Like I said, I think I got these all for less than 50 bucks or something like that. Okay, well, even with all the problems associated with this, I decided I was going to get it running at least long enough to get you some uh, running session. I just care for you too much and there's no way I can bring this particular model out of the woodwork and at least not try to run it. And you can see how badly it's struggling here. And again, the, uh, I mean, I can I could re-quarter the, the wheels, but it wouldn't last very long. So when you see the locomotive passing by, just know that I held on to it just long enough to get that shot. And then they generally went out a quarter and sometimes the wheels would seize all together. But since this thing doesn't have a smoke unit, I guess at least we're not gonna blow a smoke unit. So that's good, right? Blah. So, uh, gosh, I just, I wish I really was looking forward to this. And you can see here, it went in the curve while I was filming this and it completely seized up. And so I'm just trying to kind of work that loose. I can't tell you how much I wanted this to be awesome. And frankly, I love the way it looks and I think it looks great with this consist. I really do. I, yeah, I didn't, like I said, I picked this consist up and I'm like, I'll save it for a rainy day. And the rainy day finally came, unfortunately, metaphorically speaking. And, but I think it looks great. And, you know, for instance, this shot right here, the, this will actually seize up within seconds after showing this to you. But um, I hope this sort of bit of trickery works well enough for you so that you can at least enjoy this during the running session. Boy, you know, it, I know a lot of people do not like purple. They think it's some sort of an abomination, and I get that. I really do. But there is there is something that is standout-ish looking about it and I can understand if you don't like it but I, I think it looks really sharp and really smart and, and if anything it could be something different for your layout if you decide to pick one of these up and you can find one at the prices that aren't so unbelievably inflated right now so yeah <laughs> So that's what I got for you today. Um, I hope this helps you. Um, if anything, you know, maybe if you didn't pick one of these up and you do want one, you can decide whether the extra money will be worth it that you're gonna have to pay as a premium. I don't know if these are gonna come down in price. Yeah, my guess is they might a little bit from their currently inflated prices, but they're probably gonna be more than the storefront price always. And part of that is also thanks to the fact that the queen became unruly yeah let's just put it that way um I, I don't know you know there's a chance they'll rerun these because i can tell they were very very popular and people were pretty upset when they didn't get them so there, that's always a chance who knows um but i don't know if you want to stake you know collecting one of these on that or not so you know there you have it so let me know what you think about this. Um, if you really hate the purple, let me know. If you really like the purple, let me know. You know, I, I know right now a large part of my viewership is American, and I don't even know if there are any Americans still watching this or not, but, you know, um, certainly, hopefully they can appreciate what, <laughs> what the uh, English were trying to do here. So anyway, again, let me know what you think. I'd like to read in the comments if you guys have one of these, if you had some problems with it. Um, I'm still not a huge fan of Hornby, I'll admit, and it really has more to do with the fact that I, I just don't know if they know what they want to be yet. Um, but they, they really ought to figure it out. So, okay. Um, just as a reminder, it really helps me if you'd like this video. If you just click that, that's great. If you hit subscribe, that helps me even more. And if you, you know, hit the bell, all these things contribute to the kind of computerized analytics that YouTube uses to figure out whether I'm somebody that's worth watching or not. And if you really want to help me pay the bills, 
um, please just purchase from one of my sponsored products and the links to those are in the description along with a 10% off coupon. It may help you. So, all right, I appreciate you watching. Thanks very much. Take care of yourselves out there. And as always, happy model railroading. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.